Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told his cousin Ibn Abbas to collect stones for the Jamarat, to throw on the pebbles. So Ibn Abbas brought a whole bunch of stones and he showed them to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looked at this group of pebbles and he picked from them all of the large ones and he threw them away. And he said, no, I want the small ones. And he picked up the smallest pebble. And he said like these. Then he said to the people, Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, beware of fanaticism in the religion. Iyakum wal ghulu din Because the people before you were destroyed because of their fanaticism in the matters of religion. This anecdote demonstrates that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is warning us about one of the many problems that the Ummah will face and it is currently facing. And that is a type of fanaticism that is motivated by piety. It's not motivated by evil. It's not motivated by trying to displease Allah. The motivation is good, but it is not done based upon knowledge. In the time of Hajj, when everybody's spiritually high, in the time of Hajj with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, can you imagine what the sentiment was? And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, go pick some pebbles. And Ibn Abbas wants to pick the biggest, the largest. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, be careful, be careful. Because even in these small issues, even in the issue of throwing the Jamarat, if you're gonna pick large pebbles, you think this is more pious to Allah, what's gonna happen if the crowd is throwing these big stones rather than small pebbles and then he said based upon this small analogy he said the people before you were destroyed because of religious fanaticism because they went too far in matters of this deen and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran when he talks about other previous nations who went to extremes Allah says O people of the book la taghlu fi deenikum do not go to extremes in your own religion do not exaggerate your own religion and our prophet sallallahu alayhi he was sallam warned us continuously he said la tatashaddadu ala anfusikum don't make matters more strict on yourself for you shaddad alaykum otherwise if you do so you yourselves will make strictness upon you and he said in another hadith in bukhari and muslim he said halak al mutanatti'un halak al mutanatti'un halak al mutanatti'un three times he repeated this those who go to extremes are destroyed. Those who go to extremes are destroyed. Those who go to extremes are destroyed. Our scholars commented on this hadith. Of them is Ibn Rajab, one of the great icons of Islam. And Ibn Rajab said, Tanattu' is of categories. And of the categories is to go to the minutia of the deen and to ask what you don't need to ask and to get involved in issues that you don't need to get involved in. To really keep on pestering and asking and teasing out when you don't need to do so. When Allah says something, do it and don't ask more questions that are going to make the issues difficult for you. And the example that is given is one that we're all familiar with in the Quran. When Allah said to the Bani Israel, go sacrifice a cow, go sacrifice a cow. The Bani Israel began to say, what cow? What type of cow? What color cow? What size of the cow? What are the conditions of the cow? What are the characteristics of the cow? And they kept on making matters worse for themselves until they only ended up ruining themselves. When Allah says something, do it with the appropriate spirit and ask what needs to be asked, but do not go to extremes in this matter. Realize, O Muslims, that we have a beautiful religion, a blessed religion, an easy religion. And this is not my statement. This is in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Allah says in the Quran, He has chosen you and has not made the religion difficult for you. The religion is not be meant to be made difficult. Allah says in the Quran, Allah wants ease for you. He does not want difficulty for you. 
you. Allah says in the Quran, describing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the Prophet is the one Yadu Anhum Israhum Wal Aglal Lati Kalat Alehim. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam frees them from their chains and their shackles that used to bind them, freeing them, making them more free and more noble. Oh Muslims, realize one of the many problems that we have, and we've always had it throughout our history, is the problem of religious fanaticism, the problem of overzealousness within the deen itself. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam understood this. One of the core teachings of Islam is to warn us to not become overzealous, to not become over fanatical, to not become overtly fundamentalist. This is a common thread throughout the Quran and throughout the Sunnah. In fact, in Sahih Bukhari we learn, the first batch of students that came to study with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the Muslims began, uh, when, when the people began embracing Islam, uh, uh, when the people began embracing Islam in the year of the Wufud, the year of the conquest, the year of the delegations, excuse me, in the ninth year of the Hijrah, thousands of people embraced Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam held what we would call a summer camp. He held what we would call a summer camp. Come and study with me because you have to teach the people the religion. The first batch of graduates that studied with him, the first batch, when he sent them back, what did he say? This is in Sahih Bukhari. He said, oh people, when you go back to your qawm, when you go back to your tribe, yassiru wa la tu'assiru, bashiru wa la tunaffiru. Make things easy for your people. Don't make things difficult. Give them glad tidings. Cheer them up. Don't make them feel deflated and hopeless. Cheer them up. Give them good spirit. And don't make them turn away from the religion. وَكُونُوا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانًا And do all that you can to unite amongst yourselves. كُونُوا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانًا The first batch of preachers, the first batch of clerics, the first batch of du'at, he is giving the message to all of us preachers. Our messages should be uplifting. Our messages should be optimistic. Our messages should be cheerful. They shouldn't turn people away from the religion. They should not turn people away from the beauty of this deen. And yet, unfortunately, what we see today is that some people who claim to preach in the name of religion, their version of religion, their understanding of religion actually turns people away from the religion rather than calls people towards it. And we've always had this version of fundamentalism. In fact, in the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he warned against overzealousness and fanaticism. And he told us of a group, we now call them the Kharijites, but he told us of a group that would come that are the fanatics of this ummah, that are the literalists of the ummah. And he warned us that these people are more dangerous than the Ummah, than even the Dajjal in one hadith, he said, that these people are more dangerous because Dajjal, you will recognize him. Dajjal, you will see him, you know he's the Dajjal. But this group, the, the Kharijites, he was talking about the, the, this group, this group, you won't know they're the Dajjal. You won't know they're a part of you, and yet they're going to harm you. He warned us about this, this ultra fanaticism in a manner that every one of us should pay heed to. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I want to summarize five of the dangers of fanaticism, of extremism, of literalism, of simplistic fundamentalism. And I want to give five points to understand how we know something is fanatical and, uh, and beyond the pale, and also some guidelines of how we can avoid this reality. Because the fact of the matter is, we are all seeing, especially those that are of the next generation, we are seeing the rise of yet again another wave, another iteration, of fanaticism, sectarianism, blind-minded bigotry in the name of the religion. Those of us who are older, we've seen this time and time again. 20 years ago, we had to deal with ISIS. Before that, we had other crazy groups out there. But every few decades, a new generation comes and they haven't seen the past. And they think that the religion is meant to be the harshest and the strictest and the most harsh fatwa. And anybody who doesn't live up to their understanding of the religion, they are immediately labeled, immediately become the enemy. So much so, oh Muslims, you are all aware of the sectarian violence taking place around the globe. Muslims killing other Muslims. Muslims bombing the masjids of other Muslims. Muslims saying every other group is misguided other than our group. So there are many dangers of fanaticism, of fundamentalism, of extremism and overzealousness. And of them, number one of the biggest dangers of fundamentalism is that these movements 
They ignore the beauty of Islam and they choose and pick things that demolish the beauty of Islam. Nobody looks at such people and recognizes prophetic beauty. Nobody sees the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amongst these fanatics. Look, 10 years ago when ISIS was there, what bad image they gave of the whole religion of Islam. Don't we understand that even though there are movements that are not killing other people, but they have characteristics of those. They have the same fanaticism. Nobody is attracted to that level of fanaticism. And this leads me to my second point. It actually turns people away from the religion rather than calling people to the religion. O Muslims, one of the main reasons why fellow Muslims who want to come closer to Allah deep down inside they love Allah one of the reasons why they don't come close there are many I'm not saying it's the only one but one of them is they see the bad akhlaq and the arrogance and the fanaticism of a group of people who presume they are the spokespeople of the ummah they presume they are the arbiters of who is good and who is bad and the average Muslim who genuinely wants to be a good person deep down inside they know that the Quran is true they want to pray they want to fast but they come across this group and this group their judgmental attitude their arrogance their constant demeaning their disconnectedness from reality it rubs these people in such a bad way that shaitan comes and says to them if this is what religiosity is I don't want to be like these people not because they don't want to be religious but because those who claimed to be religious misrepresented religion and you can't blame innocent people it's not their fault they don't know any better when they see the religious folks preaching a version of Islam full of hatred full of anger full of absolutely bizarre fatwas against other people against non muslims Muslims against other groups against other genders and they're mistreating people in such a manner in the name of Islam what do you expect then what is going to happen to the average person he or she will say you know what if that is what religiosity is something doesn't make sense leave me to myself and my Lord and so the problem is this group has made themselves the spokespeople nobody appointed them nobody put them to be the guardians but they are the ones who say you must follow us and our interpretation so the second point fanaticism extremism it actually turns people away from the beauty of Islam the third problem and danger of fanaticism is that fanaticism is impossible to maintain for more than a few years and wallahi brothers and sisters take it from me and take it from others older than you who have seen this reality you cannot remain overzealous for more than a few years it's a phase you go through in your early 20s and that's it it's just a phase then you burn out you fizzle out and when you burn out you lose religion I cannot even begin to tell you how many people have I seen in my own life, in my own iterations that I've gone through. They've gone through the hardcore phase. You would think that these people think they're walking angels on earth. And within five years, because they were so hardcore, so fanatical, so overzealous, within five years, they've lost all religiosity. They don't come to the masjid. They might have left doing salah. Some of them might even have left the religion. And I have seen with my own eyes, people who used to be hard core fanatics who now no longer even identify as Muslims you cannot maintain this level of overzealousness in a beautiful hadith in Sahih Bukhari our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the last 10 nights of Tahajjud of uh, Ramadan he entered the masjid and he saw his own wives our mothers he saw them in their tents and they had a rope connected to the roof they had a rope connected to the roof that when they would fall asleep they would hold on to that rope and force themselves to pray force themselves extra and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded Bilal cut off all of these ropes get rid of all of these ropes and then he's head to his own wives worship Allah as much as you have the energy then when you don't have energy go to sleep this is our religion you're not gonna do more than a normal human being can do it's gonna harm you he said in an authentic hadith nobody will make this religion more difficult except that that will end up destroying him you're not going to outwit Allah and his messenger that doesn't work that way in another beautiful hadith our Prophet heard of the story of 
of three people who came to the mother's, our mother's households and they asked about the routine of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When they heard his routine that he would fast and go to sleep and he would uh, pray and do this and whatnot. They said, this is, he's a prophet of Allah, he's forgiven. I'm gonna do more than this. And one of them said, I will pray the whole night to Hajjud, never go to sleep. The other one said, I will fast every single day and I will never ever eat during the day. And the third one said, I will leave getting married to women. I'm gonna become a hermit, a monk and constantly worship Allah. The Prophet heard of this and he called all of the Sahaba and he said, the way to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you pray to Hajjud and you go to sleep. And you fast and you don't fast. And as for me, I marry women as well. Whoever leaves my sunnah has nothing to do with me. You are not going to come closer to Allah by making the religion more difficult. Who told you that the stricter opinion is the better one? Who told you that the harsher version of Islam is always the more correct one? This is an incorrect understanding. Our mother Aisha radiallahu anha said, Never was the Prophet ﷺ given two choices that were both permissible, except that he chose the easier of them. He chose the Aisaruhuma. This is a part of our tradition and our, and our methodology. The fourth problem of fanaticism, the fourth problem of religious overzealousness is that the religious fanatic thinks he is acting on behalf of God. And therefore, no matter what you say to him will fall on deaf ears because he thinks he is upon the truth and he's acting in the name of God. Unlike the sinner who's drinking, who's womanizing, taking drugs. You go to the sinner, Ya Akhi, fear Allah. The sinner will say, you know, you're right. May Allah forgive me. The sinner knows he's committing a sin. The sinner has more chance and opportunity to come back to the truth than the arrogant fanatic because the arrogant fanatic presumes that he knows the religion and nobody else knows it. And this is the sign of fanaticism. We learned from the seerah, the first fanatic was the leader of the Kharijites. The first fanatic that came, the, the Dhul Khwaisara, he came to the Prophet and when the Prophet did not give him the amount of money he wanted, he accused the Prophet of not being fair. He said, Ya Muhammad, he didn't even call him Rasulullah. And fanaticism is always arrogant against knowledge and the people of knowledge. Ya Muhammad, I'dil, be fair. And the Prophet said, Woe to you. Who else will be fair if I am not going to be fair? Woe to you. You didn't hear what you wanted, so you accused me of being unfair fair and then he said from his likes from his progeny will come groups of people their salah you will think it is better than your salah and their recitation you will think it is better than your recitation but Quran will not proceed outside of their throats i.e outwardly they will have the deen inside they will have no deen this is hadith in sahih bukhari our process and predicted the reality of fanaticism and overzealousness and the final danger will mention the many dangers the final danger will mention of the five and we see this in our own lives fanaticism opens the door to disunity, to harshness, to sectarianism, to division of the ummah. Fanaticism ends up with bloodshed. People kill one another in the name of fanaticism. Muslims and others, and this is the reality of all faith traditions. What we're seeing in Gaza, it is because of a fanatical interpretation of Judaism called Zionism. Fanaticism is dangerous in any faith tradition. What we saw in our own faith community of this group of ISIS, and even right now as we speak, in so many lands, different versions of Islam, different sects of Islam are killing other sects, bombing other sects, physical violence, Nobody's saying you shouldn't correct politely and gently. But where did you get the fatwa to go kill another person because their interpretation is different than yours? Who told you you can bomb masjids on Friday, which is happening across the Muslim globe? Where did you get this understanding from? The problem, you think you are acting on behalf of God. You think Allah is on your side. Then how can you possibly reason with such fanatics? So brothers and sisters, without a doubt, fanaticism is extremely dangerous but the question arises how do you know you're a fanatic because the problem comes no fanatic is going to say i'm a fanatic no overzealous person no ultra religious fundamentalist is going to say i am wrong because they have been brainwashed to think they are right so let me share with you five symptoms 
five litmus tests you can quickly use to see whether you and your group, you and your position, you and your scholarship, you and your group of people are perhaps beyond the fringe of mainstream. First and foremost, and all of these are from the Quran and Sunnah, so it's not from me. First and foremost, of the biggest signs of fanaticism is the presumption that only you and your little group is correct and everybody else is going to Jahannam. Every other Muslim, every other firqa, every other strand is automatically going to Jahannam. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in multiple mutawatir ahadith praised the bulk of the ummah. He said, Inna ummati ummatan marhuma. My ummah is a blessed ummah. He said, Yadullahi ala al jama'ah. That Allah's blessings is upon the group of Muslims. He said, Alaykum bil jama'ah. Follow the bulk of the Muslims. He told us to follow as sawad al a'zam, which is again the bulk of the Muslims. Because because there is no prophet after our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam this automatically necessitates that his ummah as a whole will be rightly guided the bulk of the ummah is upon khair and good the bulk of the ummah their beliefs and the knowledge that they have nobody is saying that individually they are correct but when you meet the individual muslim you ask him how many times to pray what to do the average muslim will know the correct understanding of islam even if they fall short in applying it. This is what our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying. Therefore, any group that comes along, any firqa that comes along, any teacher, any person that comes along and constantly says, everybody's misguided. All the other groups are going to Jahannam. All of the other scholars are sellouts. That very person has demonstrated they are the fringe by their own testimony. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Memorize this Hadith. Whoever says says everybody is destroyed is the most destroyed out of all of them whoever says halak an nas everybody's lost everybody's gone the prophet said that is the worst of them because you're the one that is assuming the worst out of all of mankind the ummah is upon khair and good and its scholars are upon khair and good and the mainstream is upon khair and good anybody who comes accusing the bulk of the ummah, the entirety of the ummah, the mainstream of scholarship to have gone astray by the testimony of the Prophet Sallallahu He is the one that is truly astray. The second symptom, the second litmus test that we have, and this is explicitly mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he talked about the first fundamentalist group, the Kharijites. He said, they will attack their fellow Muslims and leave the enemies of Islam. This is an authentic hadith where he described the Kharijites. They will attack their fellow Muslims and the actual enemies will be safe from them. Any group, any firqa, any preacher that constantly lambasts and terrorizes fellow Muslims, the fact of the matter is this is not prophetic. What unites us as Muslims is more than what divides us. What unites us as Muslims is more than what divides us. And even if a correction has to happen, even if internal debate has to happen, there must be an adab, there must be brotherly love, it must be done with nasiha. When a firqa or a strand or a preacher is known more for attacking Muslims, especially now that the genocide is going on, and they're only obsessed with trying to label other people, this demonstrates their own fanaticism. The third litmus test of fanaticism is to concentrate on the petty issues and ignore the larger ones. Lack of priority, to concentrate on the very small aspects, even if they might be correct in the broad scale of things, but to ignore much bigger ones. And this is again a characteristic of fanaticism. You all know of the terrible tragedy of Karbala, where the grandson of the Prophet was assassinated and killed by a group of evil people. One of their associates, one of their friends, came to do Hajj and he visited Ibn Abbas and he was in Ihram doing Hajj and he said, Oh Ibn Abbas, I'm in Ihram and a mosquito came buzzing and bit me and I smacked the mosquito and I know that you're not supposed to kill hunt animals, you know the, the prohibition of hunting animals. So Oh Ibn Abbas, is there a penalty for killing the mosquito? Ibn Abbas said, Wa ajaban, what a strange person you are. You and your lot killed the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you didn't blink twice and you come and ask fatwa about a mosquito? You, where's your priorities? How can you possibly be worried about this when looking in the reality of what you have done? And wallahi, this is a sign of fanaticism. And I keep on saying, 
250,000 people have lost their lives in Gaza. How can you possibly be bickering about anything else right now? How can you possibly be dividing the ummah and getting involved in abstract issues such as, and I'll be blunt here, the sectarian issues of the attributes of God, for example. It's a classical issue. It's something that academics need to discuss behind closed doors. Let students of knowledge discuss with other students of knowledge in a polite manner. But to bring this abstract sectarian theology into the public eye to have YouTube debates to have Twitter and Facebook completely abuzz with this sectarian warfare in which 99% of the ummah is completely clueless to what is going on and the 1% that is super religious and fanatic fanatic are making takfir tabdi of each other because of how they interpreted a particular attribute of God wallahi I say this bluntly how foolish are the people that are involved in such sectarian sectarian online politics even as the genocide is going on have you no shame imagine if you were in Gaza right now imagine if the people of Gaza saw you and you are bickering online about this particular abstract theological point that nobody even knows beyond your madrasa students have some shame have some hikmah this is the essence of fanaticism and I say this bluntly and loudly have some shame in light of what is happening and leave these academic discussions discussions to the private classrooms. I'm not saying don't have them. The right time, the right place, the right audience to drag the ummah into these abstract issues while this is going on truly indicates a complete lack of wisdom and of knowledge and a prophetic methodology. This brings me to my next point of the symptom of fanaticism. How do you know you are a fanatic? One of the ways you do not allow for any diversity of thought, no spectrum of opinion, my way or the highway. If you don't agree with me, you're a kafir. If you don't agree with me, you're going to Jahannam. Ibn Taymiyyah says, and Ibn Taymiyyah was very, very blunt in what he believed, but he was also a scholar. Ibn Taymiyyah definitely has his own understanding of Islam, meaning it's a strand of Islam, but he's also a person of knowledge. Ibn Taymiyyah says, it is not allowed for any person to make his opinions the criterion of Islam. It is not allowed for any human being to make his positions the criterion of correctness, such that whoever follows is a good Muslim and whoever disobeys is a bad Muslim. That is only only for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Only the Prophet of Allah has unconditional loyalty. Other, other than that, O oh Muslims, from the time of the Sahaba, we have had differences of opinion. The Sahaba themselves disagreed about aspects of theology, yes theology, aspects of fiqh, aspects of methodology. They all disagreed and they were still united in their love for Islam. We have to have that level of tolerance. And I will give you a personal anecdote that is well known, uh, meaning I know the two people people involved and it is uh, known that they said this uh, and both of these are great scholars and mentors I admire and respect Sheikh Ibn Baz the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia of the 90s and Sheikh Yusuf Al Qardawi uh, the great scholar of Islam as we're aware or many of you are aware and I'm very fortunate I have met both of these scholars interacted with them and I admire both of them and consider both of them to be of the mentors that I look up to and I have met them multiple times Sheikh Qardawi had a different understanding of fiqh than Sheikh Ben Baz we all know this or the students of knowledge know this and Sheikh Qardawi wrote his book Al Halal Wal Haram Fil Islam back in the 80s and at that time, the, the, the country was very strict about publishing books. So every book had to be approved by the ministry. And this book was brought to Sheikh Bin Baz and he read the whole book. It was read to him. He called up Sheikh Qardawi to Mecca. They, they met and Sheikh Bin Baz gave a long list of points he didn't agree with. Many points, maybe 25 points. I don't agree with this fatwa. I don't agree with this fatwa. And because Sheikh Bin Baz is senior and elder and, and he was a blind man, Sheikh Qardawi said, I didn't want to get involved in any debate. I just listened, say, Jazakallah, Jazakallah. And Sheikh Qardawi said, and this is well known he says this in a public lecture he says I thought because he disagrees with my book in 25 points he's gonna not allow the book to be published but lo and behold after he advised me privately next thing I know he allowed the book to be published and sold in the kingdom this demonstrates for you diversity of thought the views in Halal and Haram for Islam, Sheikh bin Baz did not agree with them, but he understood who am I to ban other points of view? Who am I to enforce my view when this is a legitimate understanding as well? Even if I disagree, who am I to stop other people from hearing another mainstream interpretation? And there was no labeling of Sheikh Qardawi. He wasn't a sellout or a reformist or a liberal or a demonizer or a somebody wanting to destroy Islam. This is his understanding of Islam and Sheikh bin Baz has his own understanding. Anybody who has this 
narrow-minded bigotry is once again demonstrating uh, fanaticism. And then the final point I will mention in this khutbah, uh, the five of the, the symptoms of fanaticism. And wallahi, this is the worst of them. And again, mentioned straight from the hadith of the worst manifestations of religious fundamentalism, of the worst manifestations of overzealousness is these people lose Islamic spirituality completely. Their hearts become hard and arrogant and they become obsessed with the outer form of Islam and forget the inner spirit of Islam. Once again, these are not from me. I quote you the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he warned against the Kharijites, what did he say? He said, when you look at them, their salah will put your salah to shame. Their recitation will put your recitation to shame. But the Quran will not leave their throats, meaning the Quran will not be acted on by them. The Quran will not be acted on. It's just a show. It's a shallow shell. It's an outer form. You think they're religious, but there's no religiosity in them. This is straight from the words of the Prophet wasallam. You look at them, you will be impressed, but there's no reality to that spirituality. Fanaticism does not bring spirituality. Overzealousness does not bring love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any group, any firqa, any trend, any preacher that does not bring you closer to Allah, does not cause your heart to be full of rahma and compassion maybe even mocks compassion anybody who makes fun of rahma and makes fun of the beauty of this religion wallahi they have testified to themselves that they are on the fringe of fanaticism and not within the mainstream this religion of islam is all about spirituality it is all about connection with allah it is all about tazkiyah to nafs and when you don't have that even if you have the outer form you have lost the entire plot of islam oh muslim Muslims realize that fanaticism has always been a problem from the beginning of Islam. That's why our process is warned against it. And we have to be careful in this day and age that we do not fall prey to it. Realize this religion is a beautiful religion. It is a mainstream religion. It is an ummat and wasata. And therefore be careful of falling prey to these ideas because they are from shaitan and not from the methodology of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless me and you with and through the Quran and may he make us of those who is verse that they understand and applies halal and haram throughout our lifespan. Ask Allah's forgiveness. You as well ask Him for His the Ghafoor and the Rahman. Three simple pieces of advice to protect us from extremism, from fanaticism. Three simple pieces of advice. First and foremost, without a doubt, one of the most obvious mechanisms is to not follow anonymous or youngsters, to follow the senior elders, to follow those with track records. Oh, youngsters, I'm telling you bluntly, you cannot compare a 70-year-old scholar who has 55 years of service to the community with some anonymous 25-year-old online. Fear Allah, age, wisdom, experience, all of it comes in handy. Do not think that a 25-year-old has more zealousness for the religion than an elder man. Do not think that a youngster knows his Islam better than somebody who has a track record for five, six, seven decades. We have elders in our community that have been preaching Islam since even before I was born. We have seniors that have decades of wisdom. Listen to them because you cannot learn wisdom from books. You cannot replicate experience. Experience and wisdom comes with age. It comes with seniority. And Alhamdulillah, we have great ulama in this country and around the world. So listen to those senior ulama and do not follow youngsters in fact in one hadith literally our process described the Kharijites as being asnan. they have high fangled ideas but they're youngsters in their age asnan. they have beautiful slogans but they're all a bunch of youngsters you think they're saying good but they have no experience to back up that good so point number one follow the ulama follow the mainstream follow the elders of your community because they have experience and wisdom that the youngsters don't have point number two Never trivialize dua to Allah. Be sincere. Raise your hands to Allah. Do you know, O Muslim, that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the middle of the night in Tahajjud, one of his duas was Allahumma hdini li makhtulifa fihi min al-haqqi bi-idhnik. In Tahajjud, in Sajda, he would say, O Allah, any issue that people have differed over, I want you to guide me to the truth. If he is making dua, that in confusing matters guide me to the truth, where do you and I stand? 
Have you sincerely made dua to Allah in this confusing mess of all of these different fatwas, all of these different interpretations, all of these different competing clergies? Have you ever thought, let me ask Allah for hidayah? Genuinely raise your hands to Allah and say, oh Allah, it's really confusing. I don't know which of these groups seems to make more sense. Which of these scholars, which of these clerics make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the third and final point, ta'rifuhum bisimahum. You will know them by their fruits. Any group or preacher that you associate with and they make your heart softer towards Allah. You find yourself wanting to worship Allah. Your love for Allah and His Messenger increases. This is a very positive sign. And any group or pre preacher that your heart becomes hard. You don't find ladha and peace in salah. You don't really want to worship. You're more involved in refutation. You're more involved in lambasting. You're more involved in academic arguments rather than spirituality. Without a doubt, this is a sign that something is wrong. You will know them by their signs. Look at the fruits of the people's da'wah. Look at what produces when you follow a particular interpretation or strand. And when you find that your closeness to Allah increases, then inshallah it's a positive sign. And when you find that, no, there's no connection to Allah, Allah, but I enjoy debate and I enjoy getting involved in abstract issues then this is not the religion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam O Muslims beware of fanaticism our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim Inna hadha deena yusrun This deen is the essence of simplicity Inna hadha deena yusrun This deen is the essence of simplicity and ease And no one will make this religion more strict Except that it will end up destroying him Do not make the religion stricter than it is Do not become fanatical and overzealous There is no guidance better than the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And the best interpreters of that guidance are our senior mainstream people that have demonstrated their connection with our tradition. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those rightly guided people.